Special Operations Forces are historically known to have specialized training and innovative gear to carry out elite missions. They are the first to call for hostage situations, reconnaissance, surveillance, and much more. Have you ever wondered how Special Ops have the gear needed to remain safe and lethal? Established in 1991, the Special Operations Forces Acquisition Technology and Logistics Center is responsible for all United States Special Operations Command research, development, acquisition, procurement, and logistics. SOF ATNL's mission is to provide rapid and focused acquisition, technology, and logistics to Special Forces operations. Today, I'm happy to have Major Jonathan Ritchie, Deputy Program Manager for Technical Collection and Communication at SOF ATNL. Uh, glad to have you with us today, Major. Hey, I'm glad to be here. So before we get to the super exciting stuff, can you share with us a little bit about your background in the Marine Corps and what led you into acquisition? Sure. Yeah. So I started off as an artillery officer. You know, I had the opportunity to deploy to Iraq. I got to go on the 31st new. Basically, my recruiter told me the truth, said I'd see the world and I'd get into theater. Uh, then I got to go to several years support in Japan with and without my family. But it was the assignment as the Afetis project officer back in 2016 that really put me on the path to eventually become an acquisition officer. I was already curious about the MOS, especially while I was completing my MBA. Uh, back in 2012, uh, but I not realized everything it encompasses until I showed up to Marine Corps Systems Command in 2016 to begin my first acquisition billet as an artillery officer. Did I hear you correctly? You said that your recruiter told you the truth. Is that right? That's right, he did. <laughs> okay, I just want that uh, on the record here. <laughs> so, so what brought you to join the Corps in the first place? Uh, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, like anyone else who was kind of a young adult during 9-11, on the initial invasion of Iraq. I was in college at the time uh, during both those events. And there's a certain interest. One, you, you, you see what uh, the military is doing on TV. And then you have this general sense, I think, to want to serve, be part of the solution. Definitely did not understand everything I was getting into uh, when I made the decision. Uh, but I will say deciding to stay in after my initial tour is uh, probably more aligned with enjoying what I did as an artillery officer and just looking forward to future opportunities in the Marine Corps and and the things and opportunities that you have, you know, going forward in the new billets. So when you were at Syscom here, what were you doing when you were here at Systems Command? Yeah, so I was the uh, FATES project officer. FATES stands for Advanced Field Artillery Tactical Data System. Uh, so that was the our primary fire direction system for all things artillery. I fell under PM Fires. It was actually PM AFSS under Dom Foster when I first got there transition to become PM Fires before it split into PM Fire Sports System, PM Long Range Precision Fires. And, I, and I, again, I, it was a software uh, solution. The Army was the PICA, so that's your principal component agency, inventory control uh, component agency, control agency, excuse me. And basically, they run the program, but we give money into the program. So it really gave me that joint flavor that how can we work with the Army so that our requirements can be realized you know, without impacting their requirements and vice versa. I had a very great relationship um, with my counterparts during my tenure there. It is a challenge. We are two different services, um, but I think it taught me a lot as a product officer working with another service. Definitely taught you new things as leadership, you know, as a, as a newly meant to feel great officer, you know, definitely a lot of please can you uh, as, opposed, as opposed to we will do it this way. So it was, it was a great experience. Can you give us an overview of you know, Special Operations Forces, Acquisition Technology and Logistics Center, uh, SOF ATNL? Yes, SOF ATNL, um, it's two star, kind of a directorate underneath US SOCOM. We have program executive offices uh, for each area of support uh, that we provide to the operator, similar to your portfolio managers. That's kind of an 06 level. Uh, our acquisition authorities are shaped around procuring SOF peculiar equipment for US SOF forces. Uh, we also use MFP eleven dollars instead of MFP two dollars. Basically, different set of resources with different but very similar statutory requirements. If that makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, it, well, it makes sense to me, and I hope it makes sense to a lot of the listeners. But for any that uh, that don't, maybe they can listen to all the other two seasons and uh, maybe learn something and, and understand how how the money works. With SOCOM being a joint effort, it's fairly unique within all of the DoD and in particular in acquisition, but what is your relationship like with the other services? So I'm going to answer this question in two parts. So from an interpersonal standpoint, uh, it's a great opportunity to really seamlessly serve 
and you know Bill, it's right next to other service members, right? And, you know, Marine Corps Systems Command, it's, it's all fellow Marines. We all kind of got a Marine Corps flavor. Here, it's like, you know, a lot of my the people I'm serving next to, other deputies or other program managers or other services. And in fact, in RPO, we got a guy from the Space Force. Giving him a hard time is never gets old, obviously. Um, then from a big uh, service perspective, you know, we really focus on soft nuclear equipment in every domain. But because we are in every domain, you know, we have commonalities with almost every service. I, actually, I would say every service. For example, you know, our PEO fixed wing, you know, they have the AC-130 gunship, right? Well, you know, they got the C-130s from the Air Force, right? And then we made them soft peculiar. Um, similar to our soft, our rotary wing as well. You know, we take a lot of the Army helicopters and I've had the opportunity to go down to what's called SOSA. Uh, that's our support activity in Lexington, Kentucky. And you can actually see how we take what they give us, the frames, and then we basically put our payload, maybe the right word, that make them soft peculiar to do the things that we need them to do uh, for soft forces. You know, Space Force got a shout out. I I've enjoyed a couple of times I've had a chance to work with, I think they call themselves Guardians. So I I've enjoyed working with some we Guardians. Call them, we call them a lot of other things in the office. <laughs> But you know, I will so, not, but they're not appropriate for the podcast. Yeah, this is a family friendly podcast, so we're gonna <laughs> we're not gonna go there. All right, so I know Dan Torgler, and I know that he is Marine Corps Systems Command's liaison officer to SOCOM. But I've got to imagine that everyone in your office has a certain amount of a liaison role from time to time. So, what does that look like to you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. One, we all love Dan. You know, one of the first people you get to meet when you go down to SOCOM is Dan Torbler. Welcomes you to the building, welcomes to the area. Uh, he is based out of Orlando, but he comes down and makes the effort to meet everyone uh, as we show up. And he's that person that's going to do the formal um, liaising. However, we all enable him. When he's liaising with someone that has a similar capability, like I work with PO Special Reconnaissance. You know, anytime that I'm able to lean on one of the other PMs or if He's like, hey, we got something going on with our group one and three UAS. It's a different PM, but I know who those people are. And so I'll help Dan out. I'll go look them up. And then he work on the Marine Corps side. You know, so it's kind of a fluid relationship on a supporting and supportive relationship. But it's, it's really great. Uh, you know, it does a great job. Uh, and he also keeps us honest, too. If, if I say I'm going to provide something to Syscom, he will look me up two weeks later if I have not provided <laughs> said item right. to Syscom. Uh, so it's great. Well, so now for you as a Marine officer and having been in a, a Marine acquisition officer here at Systems Command, we tend to live squarely in that area between the Navy and the Army. So we're used to liaising, you know, certainly between those two services. Does that past experience as a Marine officer and a Marine acquisition officer, does that help you at SOCOM with working with the different services? Uh, I, I do think it's helped me. Uh, it definitely allows you to see the bigger picture try to see where you fit in. Soft peculiar items, like I said, you know, they're in every domain. Uh, and so relying on information from other services is always very helpful. Um, a lot of times we ask for capabilities and they ask us for capability. All right, so now you specifically, you're the Deputy Program Manager for Technical Collection and Communication. So give us an overview of what does that entail for you? Okay, well, I'm gonna start off on a, a more of a, you know, what it should entail. And I'll tell you how I've done it, and I'll tell you how I'll be doing it. So as deputy program manager, you want to keep everyone on track, right? You're the continuity to ensure the other programs are making deadlines internally and externally, whether that's to our test organizations, et cetera. But you want to keep that day-to-day -day stuff off your boss's plate so the PM can look forward, right? You want them to be leaning forward into the next thing. Now, for me personally, it's been a little non-standard during my first 12 to 18 months there during those that time, we were short several government civilians, uh, specifically in our remote advise and assist virtual company kit program, which is our partner force program, which had just been designated a middle tier acquisition program. And then several months later, would be assigned a major combat mission needs statement to fulfill. So to put that in perspective, you know, an MTA is a lot of paperwork, required documentation. Once you're designated, you have like 60 days, 90 days for different documents. And so in the same, so a Siemens is also a time sensitive thing. If you know what a Siemens is, commission needs statement, that is where everything must be researched, contracted, procured, tested, and fielded in less than 180 days. So with those two big ticket items, my boss put me at the point of friction, you know, and so I still did some of the admin as deputy. I, th I still ran some of our meetings and those types of things, but I've definitely been kind of just moving as fast as I can 
uh, to really support those gaps. And well, several months ago, we were able to get an APM hire for the program. So I've been turning over with that individual and my boss has been very happy to have me focusing on the rest of the PM in the last month or so. <laughs> so did you go from like running to suddenly sprinting and then maybe you can catch your win now? <laughs> Basically. Okay. Listen, my, my boss is happy. She's been uh, wanting to have that, you know, the full deputy bandwidth to, to give me a lot of things. So it's uh, it's been good for everyone, but it's still a great experience to uh, get an opportunity to you know get something feel in 180 days and really see what that takes firsthand. So it's a great opportunity, that's for sure. Well, so to put that in perspective for, our, for people who have never worked in acquisition, I have known people who worked in the same program office for seven, eight, 10 years, and they never saw a thing get fielded because the thing they were working on was a naval ship, which from concept to actually fielding takes forever. And so for you to be able to take you know, multiple items in 180 days and get them from concept to fielded is very different than what you'll see some folks in a more traditional acquisition program. So, so bravo Zulu for you for getting that done. <laughs> well, I didn't do it alone, that's for sure. Ah, no doubt, no doubt. And I will get back to that. Uh, but first, let me, let me pull a thread a little bit on the, the comm side. So communications are critical to any operation. So what unique challenges does SOCOM face in the communications realm? So I have some okay answers to this question in this forum. And I have some really, really, really cool answers if you ever get to talk to me in our SCIF. You know, that, and, I, and I think that's where I'll start is, you know, the biggest thing about communications is, you know, we operate everywhere. We need to be able to talk on not just the different services, right? So all this non-service common, like, you know, what crypto are you on? We need to be able to talk anywhere and we need to be able to talk to everyone. That includes other government organizations, right? Our OGAs, all of those things. And so it really gives us a really soft peculiar requirement when it comes to communications. You know, in this in this forum, we obviously can't talk in so much detail about some of the what, what I would say are some very cool innovations. Like we said, it's it's a family friendly podcast, so right. Yeah. yeah, but it's I will say that, but just to put it in perspective, again, we operate everywhere. We don't operate um, just unilaterally. There's almost never a time we're not with either another service or another OGA, and so again, communications have to be it's very niche uh, and it's very mission specific, right? To to have all those payloads and different things that that we have that support us. So we at Mark or Syscom, we tend to get our requirements from. Mixitic, CD&I, but where do you at SOF 18L get your requirements? Who's your requirement sponsor? So at SOF 18L, our requirement sponsor is the J8. Uh, the J8 does all the same things as CD&I. They're validating requirements. That is where our rapid response team, so whenever we have a Siemens commission needs to come down, we put together what's called an RRT, and we have something like 30 days. Um, we do it much less than that. Usually we get a material solution by 10 days. In response to a combat mission needs statement from a TSOC, that's one of our like a uh, SOC year or SOC AF comes in and then we have to respond to it. They run that process. They also put out CDDs and CPDs, same stuff we do. There's additional soft peculiar process called the Special Operations Rapid Requirements Document or a SORG. That usually allows us to transition from like a Siemens into a middle tier acquisition program or into a program of record. And in the meantime, they start to make the CDD. For example, in Rayback, you know, we have a sword because we transitioned initially from three Siemens before the additional Siemens. We got this year and we literally just got a new Siemens literally today should be signed Friday. And so our sword is going to be that transition. We are a middle tier acquisition program. And then we will have a CDD as we transition from an MTA to a program of record. Again, so it's similar. We have similar things, uh, statutory requirements. We have just a couple little nuances that, that make us soft peculiar. We're familiar with MTAs and, and a lot of the other terms you used. So some of that was how you get requirements, but then some of that was how you meet the requirements. So I know that SOCOM, you know, you tend to produce very, you know, niche specialized gear in a, in a timely manner. How much does your acquisition process differ from ours I mean, when you say an MTA, is an MTA at, at SOF 18 l going to look very similar to an MTA here at Systems Command or at NAVC? Or are you doing something different in an MTA, for an example, than we would? 
we are doing so many of the same things. A lot of people, it's been a very common question is, you know, how does soft move so fast? You guys must be able to have all sorts of, you know, opportunity. Now we have a couple of things, right? We have a Siemens process and we have combat evaluations, which, you know, we'll get into later. But for the most part is that we are really buy a much smaller volume of things. And we also break out our requirements, definitely relative to the Marine Corps and some other services that I've seen where, you know, we really stick to a small thing. We like things that are ready now. That means high technology readiness level, high TRL. Um, we like to get them off the shelf and get them into the operator's hands right away, uh, as opposed to building that that Death Star, that kind of perfect uh, solution, uh, if you will. I feel like that's how we're able to go faster. It's kind of one of those uh, myths about SOCOM is our statutory authority is it's so similar. Again, it is just a little two extra tools that you guys don't have statutorily, but that's it. And then most of our programs are not Siemens. Most of our programs are not MTAs. Yeah, I'll say that listening to you describe that, it sounds very similar to what we were doing around here in maybe 03, 04, 05, relative to, you know, the Urgenons that we were doing to support, you know, a couple of wars in Southwest Asia. And so, you know, so probably uh, we either stole some inf- some ideas from you guys or everybody was independently coming up with the same great ideas. So. Talk to us a little bit about some success stories between Syscom and SOF ATNL or or just particular to your people. And I would say if you've got anybody that you really want to brag on at your end, uh, earlier you were talking about your team and you said, you know, they're the ones that get it done. So feel free to brag on some of your folks. Let's hear some success stories. Right. So, uh, you know, one success story I want to share is, is a success story that's really something out of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Romero. Uh, he is PM Fosaw, and this is something that he wanted to let me know because as I wrote my article, you know, I, I didn't just, I'd been there for months. It wasn't just my resident knowledge. You know, I went around to every Marine acquisition officer down there. I asked them about their experiences, and I did an interview sheet for each one of them to really get a good picture of our relationship. And I learned a lot during it. And one of those things was how at Family Special Operations Vehicles, they had an urgent need saving in the Marine Corps, right, for a lightweight, internally transportable, agile, off-road logistics vehicle. Well, they didn't have to develop anything because the m was already at SOCOM and it already developed. And as you know, in acquisitions, it's not just that it was developed. They'd also, also done a whole lot of testing because we know sometimes unsuccessful testing creates more development. So to have that low technical risk on a requirement you know, really allowed us to have a soft to service transition, which is when you take MFP 11 investment, right? They've made something. Now we use MFP $2, make that a program of record over in the Marine Corps. You know, and we continue to do it. And they're looking to do that again with the ultralight tactical vehicle, which is uh, currently set up to be fielded soon in the Marine Corps. And again, that, that's not my story, but I just, I did want to brag on uh, some of our friends there. But one of the things I really wanted to point out that is such a success story and is a continued success story is collaboration. You know, we have a couple opportunities of soft to service transition, but being that we do soft peer things, not it's not always going to be this high volume of things and items one for one going to the Marine Corps to become part of a record. However, there is a ton of opportunity, like within our kit, for example, we have what's called our, our ground sensor kit over in uh, inside of RPM. And they've done a lot of collaboration on the Marine Corps side, work with some of their ground sensors, but we all have different things in our kits. Well, we have built to collaborate different information and share that information. For example, test reports, those small things where it's like, hey, I'm working on this right here. Hey, we've already kind of bought that. Oh, you've done a test too. Do you mind if I get that test report? Because sometimes we can do a fielding deployment release using reciprocal data from another service. And that helps everybody out. And so, again, there is soft service transition. We definitely look for those opportunities. But what's happening constantly is those. And I know one of the ones I've been doing with, you know, CES, um, we've also looked at mobile applications for sensing cell, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth data. And kind of I present those things to them, see what they think about it. Sometimes they're like, hey, we have a I've been told, hey, we have a requirement for some of these things, but we haven't really decided which direction we're going. But now they have the library of information that we've provided them. So when they decide kind of which direction to go, you know, again, really just some opportunities. And we go back to your M-Razor example. What was interesting for me is having watched that program here on 
the syscom side well i guess at the time it was peo land system side but it's interesting hearing you talk to that you know from from the soft side all right so an acquisition you know you've talked about this a lot a lot of times it's about go faster go faster um so i venture i venture to say just listening to you that timing is super critical for you speed is important Coming from the world that I live in as the safety director here at this command, I know that speed and safety do not always go hand in hand. So how do you try to balance the risk between the two? I think the best way to kind of start off is to say you have to eat an elephant one bite at a time. You know, sometimes our programs become these big elephants and you may make some very notable progress in one area, but then come to a halt in another. And the whole program can have excessive delays even though 80% of the program is moving way above speed. But at Soft 18L, by nature, our programs are just generally smaller. And we're acquiring a small volume, get relative to the services of niche soft peculiar equipment that is already at a high TRL, you know, high technology readiness level. And I think there are programs that are elephants by necessity, right? The joint strike box, right? Throw that one out there. Like there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, however, I do think there are some programs um, that could potentially be split up to allow one capability to move faster, you know, and get to the fleet or the operator. And one term I like to I like is the term minimal viable product. Now, minimal viable product is something usually you hear in terms of software, but it can really be applied everywhere. I always try to ask myself during some of our recent development, what is the fastest I can get something to the operator that is needed and better than they have right now? If I were to ask myself, how can I get, how fast can I get the best thing to the operator? Well, for one, the best thing will keep changing as I'm developing because there's always something coming better that's going to be the best. And generally, they're not always off the shelf and ready, right? A lot of times it's, it's the best thing that we can imagine that, wow, we could, we, maybe we could develop something that would really fill this gap. And, and I don't think we don't do those things. We have an ST section. And that is there. They're looking at 2035 and 2040. But I do think that those small iterative improvements can still support the intent to have disruptive technology shape the battlefield in our favor. And the reason I say that is we get those iterative developments out there. We get real time feedback right away. Sometimes the feedback you get in the development room as you go from one iteration to another it's really not um, well challenged, right? Because people aren't using it. So you say, yep, I think that's going to work. And you build another layer. The next thing you know, you've built these four layers that really haven't been operationally you know, challenged. Maybe in an ot and &E, I'm not, ot &Es are important, but they're, you know, they're not the same as having an operator hold on to that for 18 months. For us, a lot of times, uh, certainly over the last however many years, sometimes getting the 60% solution out on time is, be is way better than the 100% solution late. And, um, Absolutely. And so I think my next question feeds into that because our commander talks a lot about our partnerships with industry. And so when you talk about high TRLs, the M Razor, for example, is something that, you know, uh, Polaris had, you know, it's virtually off the shelf for us. But so when we talk about partnerships with industry, we will rely on them all the time. We rely on other services. I know you do as well. But so how do your industry partnerships come into play? In your processes and how do they help you, uh, you know, kind of um, hit the ground running with what uh, with what the state of the art of possible is available? Yeah, another great question. So I'm going to go big to small on this one. So big and broad, you guys have you know Marine Week and we have what's called Soft Week now, formerly known as Sophic uh, for those who are familiar with SOCOM. But it's essentially a week of where you know industry is featured, right? And we're going around. And it's our chance to have those direct engagements. And there's a lot that goes into that. We don't just walk the tables. Months in advance, we're looking at what vendors are going to be a part of it. And we're setting up one-on-one -on -one encounters, sometimes demonstrations. We also have a place called Softworks, where industry, it's like our front door, we call it, for Soft 18 l where they show up and they have what's called Tech Tuesday. They present these ideas. The relevant PEOs are invited to attend and listen. My engineer at RPM, he's constantly going like Tech Tuesdays. You want to talk to him on a Tuesday, he's usually got his headphones on, trying to do other things, but also look at things people are offering. There's an example where, I can't say what it was, but there was this person, they gave us this cool technology thing. We cared almost nothing except he started to say how his thing was secured with these algorithms, right? Well, we ended up getting an engagement with that person later on and saying, hey, uh, we want that, right? We right. didn't really use 80% of what they had presented. 
But again, it's that opportunity for us. And that's going big, even smaller. We have events called Innovation Foundries. I don't know if Mark or Syscom does this. They, I, I didn't see any when I was there. But I just got back from Norway last week. Um, and uh, they had the Norwegian Soft host the Innovation Foundry 12 for Joint and Partner Communications and Austere Environment. It was sponsored by U.S. SOCOM's uh, SOP 18 ls Science and Technology, s and And so you had industry, you had academia, you had operators, and you had program management folks all descend and really go through these very specific use cases in a 2040 backdrop. And one of the coolest things about it was when you're talking to industry, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll throw out things that you didn't really know existed, right? Like what, what they say, right? I mean, hey, sometimes you don't know if an operator wants it. Sometimes you don't know if a Marine wants it because they don't know it exists. And so we start talking about some of this technology um, and, and I exchanged a lot of information. I saw a lot of good ideas relevant to my PEO and I saw a lot of good ideas relevant to other PEOs. And I saw those individuals, you know, go back and uh, that whole process is done with Softworks to where Softworks takes their proposals, they're going to accept proposals later on in conjunction with what we came up with at the design table for us to take into a potential prototyping. So, you know, a lot could come out of that. That's, again, that's something that's, I don't, I don't know if Mark or Syscom has a similar event. I so don't I, really work with s and I'm not familiar with the innovation foundry that you talk about, but obviously we've got the modern day Marine and we go to see our space and we go to, I know that at different times, different program offices would go to you know, the SHOT Show in Vegas, because you're going to see uh, what's available. And specific program offices, depending upon what exactly, uh, what their uh, profile looks like and, and their portfolio of, of items, they will go to specific industry uh, shows to, to try to understand what's available. And like you, try to schedule, you know, briefs available, you know, talky talks with, with uh, the genius folks at those companies. And I am pretty sure that like you, we occasionally come back interested in something for the 20%, not for the 80% of, of what they thought they were demonstrating. So yours, you didn't give us all the details, which we understand, but uh, but it is interesting to, to see that. As a follow-up, what new or emerging technologies would you think that maybe if you had, if industry could come to you and say, hey, we could do X, what, what do you think you're looking for? Uh, well, you know, we've we published, uh, I think, pretty well. We usually talk about it at soft week to um, as we get closer, but in my specific purview, one pretty general refrain that I've seen is inertial navigation systems that are not reliant on GPS. Okay. Um, and specifically, when I say not reliant, I mean not even initialized by GPS. Because right now, there's some pretty good tech out there where with initial GPS initialization, the INS works for pretty long. And it's like, no, like I need you to not even need GPS, but also be very accurate. And I feel like that's an area where we're very close, but not there yet. Okay. Um, we're doing an SBIR right now, a partnership that we're going to take over next year for a mesh network uh, that will be able to give us an opportunity to have a non-GPS um, way to track and locate people within our mesh. I'm not skeptical. I'm optimistic. They put a pretty good you know, technological reason of why they can achieve that. It's that kind of stuff. You know, I think that's what's next uh, to be able to really operate, not handcuffed or not reliant on, you know, systems you can't protect on the battlefield, right? Like, you're, you're the operator, you can't protect that satellite, so you need to not have to count on it. We need to be prepared to, uh, to operate in an environment where maybe we don't get to use all the high-speed toys that we're used to. So we need, well, even those inertial navigation systems would still be high-speed, just a different kind of high-speed, not using the GPS satellites. So, all right, so let's get back to... Uh, to you, you know, Major Jonathan Ritchie, uh, what uh, what do you think is next up for you? How long is your current tour, and uh, what what do you hope to do next in your career? Well, I you know, I am halfway through my tour here, so like everyone else in the Marine Corps, you know, trying to think of uh, what's next until you know closer to your summer date because that will show kind of what's available. Honestly, I'm just really excited to really work anywhere. I, I think maybe as an artillery guy. Right, you, you you think your natural progression is somewhere in PM fires, uh, long range fire system? Maybe, maybe it is, but also the opportunity I've had to work on three years on a software program. Being down here, I've gotten to work on things that are both software and sensors. To me, I just try to keep an open mind. Obviously, I'm I'm looking at opportunities, but 
but I think a lot of it's timing. And I think, you know, what opportunities will be available for me when I'm a summer 2024 mover. And I just kind of start there. That makes sense. So first of all, congratulations for taking on that responsibility for yourself, but for, for taking on the next level of service to the Marine Corps. Because when we talk to all the acquisition officers, a lot of them just talk about how fulfilling it is, but it, how important it is to the Marine Corps. And I hope that if any thread that comes through through all of these podcasts, you know, last season, this season, just how dedicated the 8061 Marines are and just what, what you provide. So, so thank you for doing that. But as a follow-up, what advice would you give any Marines who are considering uh, a career in acquisition? Uh, well, uh, step one, I would say get qualified. I remember when I was acquisitions, uh, Mark Corps Systems Command, excuse me, uh, you know, back to 2016, uh, we had several captains, um, uh, young, younger, like this, kind of doing their first B billet. And they didn't all go get their level two certification while they were there. But towards the end, they were kind of like, oh, you know what? I kind of like acquisitions. Well, whatever opportunity you have, right, get an acquisition opportunity and get your certifications and just try to keep that door open. Step mm-hmm. one. And then step two, it's just, oh, it's almost too easy of a sale for me. The, the kind of impact you have, the amount of money you're managing, the equipment that you're getting to the Morans. I, I think if you just do an acquisition billet, a cap billet as a non-8061 for three years, as you begin to see how important it is and how much can go wrong if competent, driven, um, and very detail-oriented people aren't doing the job, you can see real quickly how things get held up, how technological, technological risk is not realized, and then schedule risk shows up, right? Because you didn't look at your cost and you didn't look at your performance. And that, to me, when you just realize how important those things are, I don't know, maybe it was just an easier sale for me. I know everyone likes their community, but no matter what, whether we turn to the Pacific, keep in the Pacific, whether we turn back to Europe, whether we go to Africa in AFRICOM, and that's the important, no matter what it is, as an acquisition officer, you are going to be supporting whatever the priorities are. You don't have to worry about getting stuck in the meth that is perceived as irrelevant, right? Like I remember when SETCOM was all it is and everyone wanted to get to one meth. Right. And you're in three meth or now, right? Three meth's the priority. But right now, well, we can't forget about two meth because look what's happening in Ukraine. Right. So in acquisitions, always have an opportunity to be supporting the highest priority to the Marine Corps. I also think it's important. So while you learn the acquisition trade, all the Marines that come here come with an MOS and an expertise in whatever they had been doing during you know their first years in the Marine Corps, artillery infantry, comms, vehicles, whatever it is. Well, we need all of that expertise as operational expertise here in the acquisition community. Don't just keep that expertise out in the mess. I mean, it's great that they have some of it, but we need some of it as well so that we can build the next generation of capability to give the next generation of warfighters. And, uh, you know, if you're the expert in your field, you should consider coming here to, uh, to do that and to help us build that next generation of capability. And if you didn't come here and the next generation of capability isn't what you wanted, well, then you should have been here to help us build it. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) All right. Well, oh, and another side to what you're talking about is get the certification while you're here. I think that's a general rule for anybody in life is if somebody offers you education, take it. Absolutely. Well, Major, I I appreciate your having come on the show, um, taking, you know, an an hour out of your, your busy schedule. We have a little thing around here that we do that we call our lightning round. And do you think you are ready to answer the lightning round questions? I will give it my best shot. Well, that is that is uh, all we can possibly ask. So your best shot it is. So when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? When I was a child, I wanted to be a tornado chaser. And when I told that to my third grade teacher, oh, I'm sorry, my sixth grade teacher, uh, she said, that's a meteorologist. I said, what does that do? But I think it was the idea of trying to predict the weather. I, I grew up in Missouri, right? So we were right there in Tornado Alley. And as I learned more and more about uh, tornadoes and weather and predictability of it, um, ironically, I'm actually just as interested now uh, with all of the weather modeling and, and things that goes into that. I mean, that's really a place for machine learning and AI for sure. Well, you know, we've got a program office here that does that stuff too. So cool. So come on, come on up sometime. Maybe that could be your next, your next billet. So, all right. So if you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be? I would pick Mark Zuckerberg, but while he was still a college student. So it's funny you say Zuckerberg. I 
I can only picture him in the movie, and uh, I don't know what actual Mark Zuckerberg looks like. So, so good deal. So Mark Zuckerberg, but while he was still in college, right. that's right. Because I was a I was a Facebook Prime. I was on there while it was still your email address, and while it was still the Facebook.com. In fact, I think I was on there the first year uh, that it was created because I was a college student, right? That's who it was for. And so I, I very much want to talk to him, kind of at that moment. What really made him think of going that direction as something and the applicability of it? Uh, not that I wouldn't want to talk to him now, but I think you want to talk to that person at that moment of kind of what they're thinking, what made him go that direction before he really hit it big, right? Because now, no, I mean, we all do it. We like to sunny side the, the past and, and and make it well. You know, I like talking right at that moment what was going through his mind for that innovation that no one else really saw coming. Do you have any tips for maintaining a work life balance? Uh, well, I, I think I have some pretty good tips. Um, unfortunately, my wife would probably tell you I'm not, don't take any of my tips because I don't balance it well. But I, I do, I think organization is key. Knowing what your priorities are, you're going to take that time off. Keeping your priorities and staying organized, I think gives you the best chance to have a work life balance. You're always flying by the seat of your pants. You're going to be stressed out when you get home anyway. So the, the, the times I've enjoyed the best work life balance is the times where I've really settled in a billet. And really have my priorities set uh, and, and good understanding of what it is that I do. So, what is a TV show, book, movie, or podcast that you would recommend? All right. So, this is, I love this question. So, one of my favorite books, I'm going to give you two books, but one is a super hard read that took me multiple plane flights because it's very dry, but it's The Modern History of Computing by Paul Zerzetti. Great book. It goes all the way back and talks about how no one saw the personal computer coming. And how and it goes through different disruptive technologies where we thought we just needed faster processors. No one thought about the applicability to people having a computer in their home. It is a great book. Just through it through to really just talk through how and why we didn't see those things to really take your brain and think, you know, what is the next disruptive technology? You know, what is that we think we're just building, you know, one step on, one step on. It's really someone else is going to find a utility for it somewhere else and it's going to blow everybody's mind. And then another book called AIQ. I don't have that one in front of me, so I do need to get the authors. I could probably send it to you guys. Um, but it's a book, really, if you're looking at machine learning, it's called uh, AI, AIQ. And then the subtitle is, you know, Machines and People Are Better Together. And it takes away a little bit for all those singularity believers. I agree with the book. I don't think singularity is ever going to come. But I do think there's a ton to be gained um, learning from machines and, and really understand what machine learning is and training algorithms and all the applicability. It goes into some of the things, how natural language processing was held up for years and kind of what made that finally take off, you know, what was the innovation. Um, so yeah, so those, those are my two favorite books um, for sure. Because that second book, that's not going to lead us up to Skynet and all of the, uh, the Terminator movies, is it? Uh, if you read books like it, I, I read several other books that were in that same spot in the library shelf, and uh, they really got into the singularity, which the singularity means right machines become conscious. I don't actually believe that'll ever happen, and I liked AIQ because it was like, it's probably never going to happen, so let's worry about all the cool things we can do instead of just hoping we give the machine the right algorithm someday and, and it thinks for itself. Um, but uh, they did talk about that. It's always a fun conversation to have with folks. Well, uh, you know, Major, look, I really appreciate your coming in today. I appreciate your, uh, you know, answering all my questions, especially your lightning round questions. I and all of our listeners appreciate everything you do for the core. And, uh, so thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. This concludes another episode of Equipping the Core. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. If so, please take a couple minutes to leave us a review, subscribe, and tell your friends about us. Until next time, stay safe. This is Trip Elliott signing off.